But at the edge of the Grand Canyon, when the soul is just drawn out, and for a fleeting, God-given moment, they are non-self-conscious and only feel wonder. They have tasted a parable of what they were created for, God. What were we created for? That's the question John Piper answers in this episode of Light and Truth. This message was originally given in Phoenix, Arizona at the Desiring God 2006 Regional Conference. It's not surprising that you find the gospel described as the gospel of the glory of Christ. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And here we learn what it is to be lost, what it is to be converted, and how to minister to people between those two. Chapter 4, verse 4 of 2 Corinthians. In their case... The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. This is the definition of lostness. To be lost is to be blinded to what? Here it comes. He has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. In a sense, God is the gospel. That book over in the bookstore is one extended exposition of that verse. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. (laughs) That's really big. Whoa, what is packed in to light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God, imaged forth in man. Wow. So just let it land on you. That when Paul chose to describe lostness, he said it's blindness to glory. It's blindness to glory. To be saved is to experience verse 6. Here's verse 6. The God who said, let light Shine out of darkness once upon a time at the beginning of creation. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the solution to verse four. Conversion is the solution to lostness. How does conversion happen? Sovereign God looks into dead, dark, glory-ignoring heart and says, by sheer, unconditional, regenerating, sovereign call, let there be light. And you had read your Bible, listened to Billy Graham, Listen to the radio, going to church a hundred times, and it was nothing to you. And today, you have no explanation for why. You feel guilty for your sins. Christ looks precious. Everything has changed. You see with new eyes, and the whole book opens like a flower. And you know something's happened. It's called the new birth. It's called those whom he called. That's what happens. And the essence of it is glory is seen. Before you're saved, do you remember what Paul says about the way you look at the cross in 1 Corinthians 1? We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, But to those who are called, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Two people looking at the same gospel, the same cross, and one says, that's foolish. 
And the other says, power, wisdom, and worship. What's the difference? Verse 6. God says, sovereignly, let there be light. What can you do since God saves like that? God opens the eyes to see the gospel as glorious. You do verse five. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as your servants. For Jesus sake. I planted, Paulus watered. God made the lights go on. Don't be fatalistic about this. I mean, you're hearing me talk right now like a Calvinist, which is because that's what verse 6 says. God makes the heart see the glory. Don't ever hear us Calvinists say, God saves, nothing you can do. That is so wicked. That's so wicked. To say that's what's being said or what the Bible is being said. It's not what we're saying. We're saying the reason you can go out of here with some hope that you could go to that mom or dad or brother that you shared the gospel with a hundred times. They don't want to hear any more about it and believe that it's possible, possible that at age 70 he might see it is only because of verse 6. Through you're saying it. I mean, I, I come here so aware. I'm a sayer. I'm a talker right now. I can't do anything to make this happen. God is pleased like jets flying in formation. Wherever the Holy Spirit back here in this jet sees Jesus Christ or his father being lifted up, he flies in tandem. But if you stop doing that, he lands. The spirit does not fly through Phoenix, through Phoenix, saving sinners apart from the preaching of the gospel. He does not do verse six without verse five. So you have a job. It's a glorious job. You're free. You can't make it happen. You cannot make it happen. It isn't your responsibility. But oh, to tell the news, to share some of the things, perhaps, from what we have talked about that you can do. And God may be pleased to save the one you love. That's bullet point number 19. Number 20. I said a while ago that I would give you some clues that the unbelievers... That you know. Have something written on their heart. That's a witness. To what I'm saying. There's a place to link up. There is some common ground. Where you're not totally at a loss. To help an unbeliever. I mean you may say. You've painted a picture. Of the radical. God centeredness of the gospel. That is so otherworldly. No pagan. Sinner. Could even begin to want it. That is not true, I hope. And I'll show you the way I think about clues that are in unbelievers. Here are two or three. Why do they go to the Grand Canyon? Why do they take trips to the Rockies? Why do they fly to Switzerland and rent a little chalet in the Alps? Because when you're standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon... Or standing at the foot of the Rockies, you feel small and vulnerable. So why do they go? And not only do they go, but they go into stores and they buy big, glossy picture books to remind them of their insignificance when they get home. And you know why. If you've been tracking with me at all, you know what that is a whisper of in the human heart. God has not left them without a witness. They were made not for the salvation of self-esteem, but for something magnificent. 
outside themselves. They know it. They know this. They know that the deepest, highest, longest pleasures they've ever had have not been when they stood in front of a mirror and liked what they saw. That's, that's fun. Nobody likes to be unpleasing in front of a mirror. But they know that's so small. It's just, yeah. But at the edge of the Grand Canyon, when the soul is just drawn out, and for a fleeting, God-given moment, they are non-self-conscious and only feel wonder. They have tasted a parable of what they were created for. God. You can help unbelievers with this. You can help them with this. To show them that many experiences in their lives are pointing not to the truth that heaven will be a hall of mirrors in which they like what they see. You can help them feel how small that is. I don't think they're going to be any mirrors in heaven. I just think Jesus will be everywhere you turn. And there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And... All the things that he has made will come into their own as witnesses to himself. There will be no competition. That's one clue. Here's another clue. I asked the guys on Thursday night, why do you guys, there's about 500 of them in that room over there. Why do you guys go to football games, professional football games, basketball games? Why do you go to museums, maybe some of you don't, or symphonies where there are artists and and players of music that are way better than you are? Why do you go to movies where they can act so much better than you? I mean, you sit in front of a football game and you watch these guys and you know they're better than I am. I cannot do any of that. You go to a movie, I cannot act like that. You go to a symphony, I cannot play like that. So here are all these things we go to documenting our inferiority. And we go. Why? Why? Do you turn on those games when they're so much better than you are? They must, it just must make you feel really weak to watch these 350 pound guys bang into each other and get up off the ground, not wounded. You must feel really vulnerable and weak. And you go to a movie and you admire a performance or a play. And you know, I'm a dud when I get in front of a group. I can't act at all. So you feel inferior there. And you go to a museum and you see this magnificent art. You say, I can't even draw a stick figure. So I feel really inferior in this room. No, no, that's not what happens. Why? Because you're being drawn out in some sweet moments of self-forgetfulness to admire greatness. Just a parable. Of why we're made. We're not made to feel great about ourselves mainly. We're made to feel great about God mainly. All these things are testimonies in the heart of fallen human beings. That they're made for God. And we can help them on toward that. And then when they feel absolutely inadequate and hopeless to get there. We can tell them about the event and the achievement and the offer and the application. All aiming to get them to the Grand Canyon. Which is a million times more stunning. Even than what the Hubble telescope can see. You can connect with unbelievers like this. I believe with all my heart, you can. So how do I become more like this? How how do I see him more clearly, love him more dearly? You've said God is the gospel and we are created to see him and savor him and display him. I'm just not there. I'm not where I want to be. I'm looking through a glass darkly that's really dark. And the mirror kind of attracts me, and so does lunch, frankly. It's 12.15. <laughs> I had about half an hour's worth. <laughs> but but I, wrote, I wrote this all in a book. It's called When I Don't Desire God, How to Fight for Joy. That's all that book is, is an attempt to answer the how question. And I was going to talk about sovereign illumination, which we saw. I was going to talk about prayer. Satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love. I was going to talk about suffering. 
You have to get the skin ripped off. You have to get the old idols removed. They're very painful to give up. God uses suffering to knock the props out from under our lives. Second Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. So that we fall on him and recognize him as all sufficient. And I was going to talk about pondering his excellencies. And I had a list of 15 excellencies of Jesus. That was build at point number 21. Number 22, I was going to comment that God created the universe not simply for us to have private enjoyment of himself, but for us to bear fruit from that enjoyment in acts of love and sacrifice that make his glory visible. Matthew five sixteen. let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your father in heaven. And my argument was, is that those good deeds flow from satisfaction in God. And I had a whole slew of texts that support that. From 2 Corinthians 8, 2 to Hebrews 10, 34 to Matthew 5, 16. That was bullet point number 22. If you delight in God, like I've encouraged you to do, you will be a loving person towards other people. With your soul satisfied in God, you'll begin to spill over with generosity and sacrifice on others. It creates world missions. And finally... I said I wanted to close and let Edwards have the last say because he is my teacher and I I would like to honor him in this way. So here's the quote. It comes from God glorified in the work of redemption by the greatness of man's dependence upon him in the whole of it. (laughs) That's a sermon title from 1731. And I'll read this and then pray and we will be done. The redeemed have all their objective good in God. God himself is the great good which they are brought to possession, into possession of and enjoyment of by redemption. He is the highest good and the sum of all that good which Christ purchased. God is the inheritance of the saints. He is the portion of their souls. God is their wealth and treasure, their food, their life, their dwelling place, their ornament and diadem, and their everlasting honor and glory. They have none in heaven but God. He is the great good which the redeemed are received to at death and which they are to rise to at the end of the world. The Lord God, he is the light of the heavenly Jerusalem. And is the river of the water of life that runs and the tree of life that grows in the midst of the paradise of God. The glorious excellencies and beauty of God will be what will forever entertain the minds of the saints. And the love of God will be their everlasting feast. The redeemed will enjoy indeed other things. They will enjoy angels and will enjoy one another. But that which they shall enjoy in the angels or each other or in anything else whatsoever that will yield them delight and happiness will be what will be seen of God in them. Lord, I pray. That you would make plain what is meant by the sentence, God is the gospel. Not in any way, oh my precious Savior, to diminish your cross. But rather to see why such a price was paid. That you might bring us to God. Jesus, we collectively here thank you for suffering, dying, rising, achieving, offering freely, and accomplishing in our lives. The sight and the savoring. And the satisfaction in your Father. Dismiss us now, I pray, with your merciful and abiding presence. We want to fellowship with you now 
and forever. And in that fellowship, we want to spill over in generosity and sacrificial love to this needy world. Here and among all the nations. I ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper begins an eight-part series titled, The God We Trust. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.